Okay. All right, fine. Uh, we had a, a longer time for you because we wanted to hear a longer thing about public safety and the things that the city was doing. But then you found out and communicated with Becky um, that the mayor has some ideas, additional ideas about how to, how to do that. So um, thank you for being here tonight. And if we could start right now with your explaining that, how, um, how the city is setting up to have the community involved and to hear as plans proceed about the public safety changes in the city. Sure, well, I've come um, to, to talk a little bit about some of the things that Becky specifically um, put in her email, but just so that you all know, we are working, I was working on scheduling a ward level forum, right, that would have the inspector here, um, would have the mayor here because he, he does have direct authority uh, over the police department. Um, and then in trying to schedule that, figured out that um, actually, because there were so many requests for similar things around the city, that instead they were going to do it by precinct around the city and that this was already in progress. Not, I should also add also to include our Office of Violence Prevention. So in my trying to wrangle all of these schedules and come up with a time that would make sense for people in the 13th Ward, um, a, a bigger, more, you know, routine of the ones of a similar concept across the city was being um, formulated. I still don't have a firm date for that. I've also heard a great appetite um, from people to discuss other kinds of topics related to public safety. Um, one of those being, um, I guess, maybe more from Lynnhurst and Fulton neighborhood feedback, um, really very interested in the prosecution side um, of how, you know, of the difficulty and then coordination involved in prosecuting people for crimes, because as we know, there's, um, it actually turns out there's very few people doing quite a lot of damage in our environment and how, you know, new techniques and stuff on that. Um, there's interest in that, in that criminal justice system, right, as to how things that have happened to people even here in our neighborhood will ever get um, before a prosecutor get charged or not and get to a judge. Those are questions I can't answer, but I'm happy to host and find the people who can. Um, there is and another topic still that I think will be a future one, um, give it a couple of more months to get up and running, but I would really like to dive into the, the reimagining work that we're doing on public safety um, and bring in and start to talk about um, the, the changes and ways that we are looking to develop other ways um, for, to, for people to call for help and to get help when they need it for different types of things. So um, I came with just a couple of touch points on crime prevention efforts in general, and then a little bit on the chief um, and the chief's replacement. So, um, you know, I meet with our fifth precinct inspector regularly. I'm in pretty consistent communication with her, um, you know, throughout different weekends and when there are some things. I don't hear about everything um, contrary to popular belief and belief by victims. I don't get notification. Um, if you've had an interaction with the police, I don't have your phone number, I can't go to your house and see how you're doing, unless you call and reach out to me, and I would love to do that, and I'd spend a lot of time with victims of crime, and that used to be, frankly, in other parts of our city, and now um, it happens also right here in our midst. Um, as you know, Inspector Kitty Blackwell has also been on trial. She's been a witness for the current prosecution um, of three former MPD officers. So she has been unavailable to, to a large extent these past few days. Um, but in general, I'm in pretty close contact with her. Here are some of the strategies that MPD is currently employing, um, like right now that I can share. If you've reached out to my office, you've, you've heard um, about unmarked squad cars that MPD is using to interrupt carjackings in our city. Um, we've seen quite a few successful stings using that method. However, you also know, like I said before, that a lot of these folks are apprehended, are released from jail pretty quickly due to a combination 
of COVID precautions um, or their age. Uh, a number of the people involved in carjackings are juveniles. Um, we found a significant number of these thefts are a small number of people. So to counter this, um, particularly on the adult side, MPD has partnered with a number of organizations that will help to build cases against the people who go way beyond carjackings, right? Like finding where stolen credit cards from cars are being used and to build out stronger legal cases um, that end up in stricter or mandatory sentencing kinds of charges. Um, the county has even joined us in this effort. They've assigned dedicated prosecutors for juvenile offenders to help to coordinate that better um, and also carjackings. That doesn't seem big, but having a dedicated prosecutor does mean a higher level of attention to these cases. And theoretically, at least, I don't, haven't seen it play out, um, more resources that hopefully lead to a system of predictable consequences. Um, you know, we are still, as you all know, overcoming a huge staffing shortage in MPD. However, you know, we're working to deal with that through um, everything, um, including, you know, our regular and continued use of overtime um, to fulfill staffing. We continue to pull people out of investigations and out of our investigative capacity to fill patrol kinds of needs, but we are hopeful um, on the recruit classes that we have starting this year. Um, I am determined to improve our response times in terms of priority calls, like priority one calls and emergency kinds of calls. Are there any questions on that part? Mm -hmm. Or I should, I should leave that to Judy to interrupt me. <laughs> um, um, so also, as you've all heard, um, Chief Arredondo has officially retired from MPD as of last December. Many of you already know this, um, but the chief was an amazing person to work with. He brought a higher expectation of accountability and public trust to the position, and he really sets the bar high for his replacement. Currently, Mayor Fry has put forward former 5th Precinct Inspector, who, which is why you maybe have met her in the past or you know her, Amelia Huffman, um, at, who was serving in the capacity of Deputy Chief as our interim chief. And she's been serving in that role for the past month. Um, I have tremendous respect for Chief Huffman. I find her to be an incredibly smart and capable person around structures and around policy and moving our department forward in important ways. Um, she lives nearby us. She lives in the city. Um, the mayor is, and I applaud um, still performing an external search to bring in additional candidates to interview. You might have read in the paper recently that um, there are a number of police departments across our country looking for new um, capable chiefs. And it will be tough, but we will be, he says he will be bringing forward a name for a permanent appointment later this year. That is still um, something that the, chief, the mayor names and the council confirms just like any appointment in our city. So um, the other piece I really wanted to talk about briefly was movement forward in other kinds of public safety efforts outside of policing. Um, you know, currently both the mayor and city council are convening public safety work groups. Um, I should say the, the council's side of that hasn't been drawn up yet, hasn't started yet. Um, but to consider alternative public safety policies and different kinds of police reform opportunities. The mayor's work group has met a few times since December. Uh, I believe they plan to make some announcements in the next month or so on what um, they recommend as new opportunities to move our city forward. On the council side, we're still working to determine what the makeup of that work group should consist of and what it should be focused around, right? How to make that um, you know, different and appropriate for our role and authority. I anticipate um, that that will be more about the reimagining work, the other kinds of response 
the types of violence prevention kinds of things and investments we can make in our city. Mm -hmm. um, we had a later start as we onboarded seven new council members, but having had our first cycle of meetings, we're now you know starting to jump into this work. What we know um, at this point is the work group will have external stakeholders and community members as opposed to exclusively council members. Um, I find this setup brings a broad spectrum of voices to the table who have um, a lot of real world experiences to share. Uh, I don't have a timeline for that work just yet, but we should have those details figured out in the next few weeks. Um, in last year's budget, the council set aside funding to create a pilot program to provide direct emergency mental health response as an emergency 911 response model separate from a police response. Uh, you might have heard of it as Canopy. Canopy has been up and operating for a number of weeks now, and I do anticipate a report back to the Public Health and Safety Committee later this quarter. Um, as we continue our discussions about how we provide alternate response models for 911 calls, it will be very helpful to get the results of this pilot program that I think will help inform future conversations. The other piece um, is something that we're going to be hearing and discussing a lot tomorrow at Public Safety Committee, which is a, a large staffing study. Um, it, it's an 84 page study that I, I have not personally gotten all the way through, but I have a lot of um, I have a lot of thoughts about it and questions for tomorrow. I think the Star Tribune got it right today when they said, that the study consultant included points that could support arguments both for and against increasing police staffing. Um, and I think we can argue those two points all day, but um, I think by far the most important point of this staffing study that to the point that I've finished, I will be finished reading it by tomorrow is that the consultants handed us a document that shows that the city needs to answer serious policy questions about how officers should spend their time. And I think when we answer those policy questions, that will help us point to what that appropriate staffing need should be. Uh, do we want our officers to be more one-dimensional or in only ever respond to dangerous 911 calls? Um, and nothing else, you know, how much, how much crime prevention should be expected of a police officer? Um, how much of their time should be dedicated to training? How much of their time um, should be, how much, how many people should we have in these specialty areas of investigations that we used to have? Um, and now with a greatly depleted department have needed to move all of those people into 911 call response. So I don't think, um, maybe perhaps unlike some of the quotes in that Star Tribune article, I don't think we can make a conclusion either way about staffing and, until we answer those questions um, and hear more from the public about it. Any questions? Yeah, Jen, Jen, you're, you're on mute, honey. Sorry, yep, I unmuted myself. Hi, Lenny. Hello. I have a question. Um, I saw something on social media, and I don't know whether it's true. And if it is, I wanted to know what you thought about it was. Um, apparently, I'm frustrated because the police have been telling us all that they're just so overtaxed that they just don't have enough man hours, enough money, enough people to do their jobs. But apparently, in Lowry Hill, the residents are chipping in um, $220 a month in order to buy two hours of police time in something called a buyback program and I may be the last person to this table. I'm sorry I didn't know about this sooner, but I'm asking about it today. Is this a real thing? And is this what is happening? Mm -hmm. Buyback is a normal thing. We use buyback. We use buyback as a city to fill shifts that we can't sh fill when we um, when we seek to fill um, you know a certain number of people on patrol at a precinct on a certain shift. Um, neighborhoods have used buyback programs in the past, NRP money has used, has bought buyback um, programs in the past. Um, Lynnhurst is one of the neighborhoods that has used buyback programs in the past. Um, this is more common in things like, there's an uptown business group 
um, that uses it. The Orpheum Theater uses it. Um, it's a pretty regular thing uh, for downtown kinds of events that need like bomb squads and, you know, sniffing dogs and other kinds of more sophisticated type of patrol. Um, but I think it's been a little bit mischaracterized online. Uh, so let me help just to kind of explain that. I mean, this is one additional way to supplement needs. Um, an inspector of any of the precincts uh, might say, and for example, Katie Blackwell a couple months ago um, did say she was having such a rash of burglaries in such a short period of time that she literally called in the next shift of workers several hours early, right? That's on buyback. That's on people who uh, are willing to and can make it into the office, so to speak, and start their work earlier. That is essentially a buyback program. It has to be um, accounted for at the end of a year, um, but those are usually based on need. Um, places in our city that um, where there are, I mean, this happens all over the city. I've seen it, um, well, I shouldn't say that. I, I don't have enough data points to say where I've seen it or not. Um, but since we know, since when you coordinate buyback, it's like a coordinated form of off-duty work. So like since the police department knows that there's this many officers working in XYZ place, in your example, Jen, in Lowry Hill, um, buyback, um, they know that those officers are there, right? They can spend more time of those that are on duty that night or day or whatever shift in other parts of the city. So, um, you know, the fifth precinct, one of their neighborhoods is Lowry Hill. They already, they might know, well, we have this other program running there for now and we can allocate our resources to other areas of need within the fifth precinct. Um, buyback takes a backseat to other needs. So as soon as we need more officers on duty for something that happened, well, then those officers are no longer on a buyback program. They are on duty officers. Um, we don't guarantee buyback in our city. Um, and I'm honestly a little bit suspicious that Larry Hill is ever going to be able to fill those spots that they say that they're going to, um, that they're asking for, right? Um, when an organization, in this case, the Lowry Hill neighborhood enters into an agreement with the city for buyback, they can be filled or not, right? You can also call it off. Lowry Hill can be like, hey, you know, um, we had these two kind of suppression pushes and we are not seeing the level of crime or whatever that they were expecting anymore. You can call it off. Um, there are, let's see, um, I can't, I don't really know how the city can say that we would do it for one organization um, and not for another, right? So like when choosing to implement an option for buyback or not, um, we don't evaluate whether it's justified. Um, we're not here to make a judgment call. Um, we will always approve any request that comes from an area of need based on what the leadership in that precinct think. Um, so we, we charge an hourly rate or a flat fee. Uh, that fee, if I'm remembering it exactly, is $107 per hour. And that's essentially overtime pay for the officer. It's variable fringe and it's equipment. Um, so like a squad car, um, that is, you know, that is one method. It is, um, since any organization like this, like the entity that was formed in Lowry Hill could alternately go and um, seek to fund off-duty officers, we would, it benefits the city more to do it like this because it, it is done in a proactive, coordinated way where the city knows what's going on and when and where. And for example, the fifth precinct, which also services Linden Hills and all of my seven neighborhoods um, can plan for it and they can plan their resources accordingly. So that is a program. Um, 
it is something that we use internally and it's something that any external entity or group uh, could seek to fill. Again, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that I would be surprised if we're going to be able to fill, fulfill that given um, our difficulty in just, you know, being able to fill our own shifts in the house. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions right now? Any other questions at all? Oh, there's a lot there. Leah, where, where'd she go? You keep popping I'm around my screen. I don't know why. I know. I, so I can't find you. Patrice <laughs> is, looks at, like she's up next, Judy. And then Mylene. Okay. Um, Patrice? Where, 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 Hi. Where? I'm sorry I'm not on camera. I'm oh, sick. Okay. Today, so I'm not really feeling okay. like being on camera. Okay. Um, so as a parent, um, I am deeply troubled by the idea that we keep hearing over and over and over again that these, uh, to me, kids are committing these crimes. I mean, anywhere from, I've heard anywhere from 12 years old up to 18. And so, and then they're let go because they're underage. What, and you know, and yet we're trying to do all these things with helping youth, but how, are, how is the city involving the parents? I mean, if this were my kid, I would wanna know. And I would want them to have consequences. And I'm just wondering why the consequences, if, if this really is children and they're frequent, uh, you know, redoing the crimes, what is going on with these parents and why isn't this even within the community? I mean, if they are known characters and they know the community, I mean, to me, they should be tailing these kids. Um, yeah, um, I'm not, thank you, Patrice. I think that's a really important statement. It's one that um, came up in a group discussion that I was having yesterday uh, with our Hennepin County Commissioner, uh, Marion Green, um, and some, some residents, many of whom were victims of violent crime by children. Um, and, and I say children because they're under 18. Um, and, and yet they are doing, you know, I, I can't imagine what it, where a 12 year old learned to drive. Um, I don't, I, I, I don't know um, we have worked to implement, starting to implement um, more and more kinds of um, re, how do I say, reestablishing the social systems that maybe help gave um, at-risk kids, kids that don't have um, a strong adult uh, support system at home, um, other options, right? Other kinds of activities. Um, to do. That's part of some of the long-term strategy that's a, a coordinated initiative with that includes Hennepin County and the social services system a lot. Um, some of the things that we spoke about yesterday were about, um, it was Catherine Johnson, who is, she now works for the county and she runs a lot of the um, juvenile corrections systems. And she said, you know, um, unfortunately, Unfortunately, um, we don't really have, there isn't really a middle ground anymore. Um, there isn't like a whole system in place. You have a, a juvenile offender who is on home monitoring. Now that would presume that they have the help of an adult to monitor them. And also um, it, what is now like a remote social services worker um, you know, assuming, I guess my own assumption there is like, like ankle bracelet kind of technology, right? Tech geofencing kind of technology where they know uh, where a juvenile that is an offender that's on home monitoring is at all times. Um, their ability to go and, and find them when they leave that area, I guess, is, is a bit dicey. Um, and CJ says, you know, we have this not really working home monitoring level or we have full on red wing juvenile incarceration and we no longer have 
things in between that um, to help provide that system of consequences and that um, that structure. Um, it, it is scary. It's something that is, I think it's really a coordinated effort. Um, it's a coordinated effort and it's something that a couple of my colleagues have been talking a lot about that they want to have conversations in their communities um, about community violence is what they call it. Um, that's a, a space that I would show up in to listen um, and to learn, but that is not, you know, that's not really, um, it's not really what I've seen or heard about in Linden Hills. Um, but all of these things, and I appreciate, um, I appreciate the question. I'm sorry, I don't really have any sort of clear cut answer to it, but it's something we're all wrestling with. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll take one more question. So Mylene has her hand up. Yeah. Um, hi, Linnea, I'm just curious, a few questions in terms of um, how many officers were before um, the summer of 2020, how many officers were patrolling the fifth precinct before many left at that time? And how many are currently patrolling the fifth precinct today? And then sort of what, what are the numbers that you guys need? How many officers do you need to either get back to the number that you've deemed to be acceptable? Um, has there, have there been any case studies done in the last six to 12 months? to determine how many officers we need in the city or the fifth precinct to kind of stabilize the crime situation? Sure. Um, I think that I don't, I don't have those clear numbers for things like the fifth precinct. I know that um, one number that concerns me greatly that I do know is that there have been some shifts in the past few months at the fifth precinct where there are eight officers working in total on a given night shift, right? And that's eight officers includes a supervisor and a desk sergeant. Um, so that means that there would be three squad cars um, available at any time with two officers in them. Sometimes in what I've personally seen during the day around here, when I see a squad car, it often has just one person in it, um, but they're going to really non-critical kinds of calls. But, um, you know, a, a night shift that only has three squad cars for 20 neighborhoods, uh, one of those being Linden Hills, is, is just not enough given our call volume, right? If we had less 911 calls for service where they were asking for an officer for a call, um, that that, that might in some world be enough, but it's just not given our um, call load. Um, now the fifth precinct has the largest land area that they support, but usually has some of the smallest number of like minimums that they're trying to meet. And it's in part attributed to this is the safer part of the city, right? The fourth precinct has, I think, minimums of 20 officers on some given shifts. So, um, I don't know the exact number of staffing because when you're staffing in a 24 seven model, uh, it's not, it's not the same type of thing where like in a business, you could say, I have this many FTEs. Um, it's a little different than that. My, um, the, the summer I've been, a, I've been your council member for eight years. If you've lived in Linden Hills for eight years or more. And um, I remember the first summer having then Chief Janae Harto speaking to our public safety committee. And I was asking her, we have, we had at that point in time dipped to a, a, a low and it was like 784 officers for a spat of crime in, in August of that year. And I was asking her, why were, why were we approving all of these overtime dollars to try and meet these shift minimums, right? Like, why are we what, where is the balance, right, of how you employ overtime versus just hiring more officers? And at that point in time, there was a push. Uh, it was a five-year plan by then Chief Harto and then Mayor Betsy Hodges to get up, I think it was 40 or 50 officers. They're going to increase the, the total count, right? I do think that those are the numbers that are um, 
logically safer for our city, assuming that we need officers to respond to 911 calls. Now, something else that you mentioned, Mylene, is about are there any studies about that? And that is um, that is the report that I was just referencing where I'm not done reading it. It's 84 pages long, but it's available online and I'd be happy to put um, a link to it in the chat here. Um, it is a, it is a report on how our patrol department works. Now it, it does not comment on our investigations, which I think are a hugely important and overlooked part of a staffing model of any police department. Um, it doesn't look into our supervisory, right? These are paramilitary kinds of organizations. There is a lot of levels of supervisory things and is all of that needed? Do all of those people need to be sworn? I've questioned that in the past. I'd like maybe a few really good civilian managers in our police department that I don't know that you need to necessarily be sworn, but there is a lot of state law that says um, who you can manage as non-sworn non-licensed, non-post-board licensed officers. We have a lot of civilians in our police department and I'd look to expand that. Um, but so this particular study that we're reviewing tomorrow and I'm, I'm deep into really sort of talks about what kinds of calls, are we sending officers to calls where you could instead send somebody else? And by my read of this document, it seems like you could send civilians, if you had these models, if you had 24 by seven new ways to respond, you could send civilians to 17% of the non-state required calls, 17%. And they talk about, you know, the right now, if you're satisfied with our current level of call response, which I'm not, it doesn't respond to even all the priority one calls, let alone priority twos and threes of people that are asking for officers. But um, to we, we have been using 1.7 million hours per year of police officer time. And what they're saying we could instead build a model to use is one and a half million hours per year of um, police, licensed police officer time. Now I have some questions about that, right? I mean, what are calls that people would opt to have a different type of response if they could, if we had that, if it was known? Um, I also really question how things get dispatched, right? Like my background from long, long ago uh, when I was in college was I was an EMT. And I know firsthand that what you get dispatched to is oftentimes nothing like what you actually show up to. So was a licensed officer presumed to be needed for a call of a certain type or call code, but then when they got there, it ended up being something that really somebody else could have handled. And then what does an officer do at that point? I mean, right now we have officer response. So that officer takes care of that person, that person that needs assistance. Um, I don't think we'd have a model where then that officer just leaves and says, oh, you need a different person here. Um, so I think there's just a lot of questions about that, but we are digging into that, Mylene, and I think some of that might mean innovation in um, the, the, the types of calls that 911 callers dispatch, right? Like, are there other categories for unknown trouble where we could send a more targeted type of help? I don't know, and I don't know how hard that would be to change, but we are looking into that. This study has been going on for like, well, we commissioned it over three years ago. So I'm actually quite eager um, to talk more about it when we, when I know more. Um, thank you. And Linnea, a, a, a viewer is asking in the chat, where is the best source to read about local crime, not next door? Thank you. <laughs> That's right. Um, <laughs> um, I, I will put that um, in the chat to everyone. So, oh, I'm now seeing that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not next door. There, the InsideMPD.com um, makes it very easy to zoom in and out of different things you might be looking for. Um, InsideMPD.com. And um, I will look afterward before I hop off this call to put is both that. that. 
Mm -hmm. It's a website that is maintained on a daily basis with crime statistics uh, that comes directly from our MPD department. Thank you. All right. Um, um, oh, you know what? And to be frank, I just tried to go there myself and I got an error code. So I'm hoping I am remembering that correctly. Yeah. Okay. All right. Linnea, thank you so much for coming. Thank you very, very much from all of us. And we will, we want you back all the time. So <laughs> to, to, you know, thank you for your clarity and, um, and your candor. I, I appreciate that very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for having you. me tonight. Again, thank I'm going to put the, um, the link that goes right to crime stats in the chat now. And then um, I'm also oh, going to put a okay. link to that staffing study that I've been um, talking yeah. about because I think it deserves a lot of um, a, a lot of a lot of looking into right I think as we look to reimagine public safety this could be one of our guides mm -hmm. so thank you thanks for your thank time you very much okay good night <laughs>